Now, over these past weeks, we have been reminding you continually that uh, Matthew wrote his gospel for a Jewish audience. We believe it's an audience that lived in Antioch in Syria, where there was a large uh, Jewish community. It's important because Matthew, throughout this gospel, refers to things, uh, images, sayings that will resonate in the Jewish mind because of the familiarity with the Old Testament. Quite different from someone who's writing for a Gentile audience who did not know or have the images that the Old Testament presented. Now this here is a nature miracle. It's a nature miracle. And we find here that uh, Jesus is walking on the water. And then, of course, he invites Peter to also walk on the water with him. Now, what is so significant about this is it has a reference to the book of Genesis. Remember in Genesis where, where God uh, creates order out of disorder, order out of disorder, separates the land and the sea, and God commands the waters to recede, and we then get dry land. And so God then has power and authority over dominion of the seas, over the waters. Now, what's important about this also is, for the Jews, the uh, water, not just for the Jews as a matter of fact, for the ancient people, water was something that was terrifying to them. When you get a storm like this, I was on the Sea of Galilee, and I was there during a squall, and it was frightening. You're on a little boat, and these are modern boats, and all of a sudden a squall comes up, and everything is rocking. So you could imagine how the disciples felt on a little fishing boat, and everything is rocking, and the waves are wild. And of course, the ocean then signifies for them danger and also death. And so when Jesus comes walking on the water, what do we have? God, once again, in control of nature, back to Genesis, and then he invites Peter to walk on the water. And so what we have here is a scene where there is a tremendous danger. Peter is invited to join in the new creation that Jesus is bringing about in the world, putting things back together again, because God does not like disorder. God likes order, because people can live in order. You cannot live in chaos. You cannot live in disorder, because what? It causes people to endanger their lives in disorder, whether it be a disorder of nature or the disorder that human beings perpetrate. Wars, riots, these things are all dangerous to, to human life. So he invites Peter then to come and walk on the water. Peter uh, gets out of the boat and begins to walk on water. And uh, all of a sudden he realizes, what am I doing? And he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. And he yells, Lord, help me. And Jesus gets him by the hand and he pulls him out of the chaos. He saves him from death. So you can see this wonderful imagery that we have here and all the implications that it has for us, especially when we live in danger or in dangerous in dangerous times, or when we think that we are being overwhelmed by events, whether they're natural events or they're events, as I said, caused by human beings. We're living through now a, a crisis of terrible disorder. This coronavirus has everybody frightened. That's why you're wearing masks, right? We're scared. People are frightened. Why? Well, people are dying. The media is certainly having a good time scaring us even more. People are concerned about a lot of things. Getting sick. They're worried about their families. They're worried about, worried about their jobs. They're worried about their, their finances. We're even worried about a very, very difficult political situation with elections coming up. And so people, people are very scared. You know what happens when people are scared? They lose hope. 
they lose hope. Everything seems like it's, it's hopeless. What's the use? And when people begin to feel that way, two things happen, and they're happening right now. Number one, the suicide rate is higher. When people are frightened, when they're scared, when they think it's hopeless, the number of suicides increases. And there's something else that people don't think about. The birth rate is down. This has been going on now for some time. People live in a world that they're afraid, they see no future for themselves or for their families, and so they don't even have children. Children, when they are produced by a society, they're a sign of hope. So you might remember, uh, after World War II, some of us uh, were baby boomers, right? There was a lot of hope. Everything is going to be fine. The country's on a roll, and we had a lot of children. My family had one of the smaller families on the block. We had four. There was some with eight and ten. Amazing. But there is a birth dearth in Western society. Now, how do we uh, restore, restore hope? Um, let me tell you what happened to me just a, a few days ago. I was over at Physicians Regional Hospital uh, over here on Pine Ridge. And uh, they have been hit hard with a lot of sick people over there. A lot of sick people. And uh, I went up to uh, the intensive care unit. I usually try to stop in every day just to see you know, if I'm needed up there. And um, I met a nurse in the elevator and I said to her, how are you doing today? She says, Father, I'm getting by with my faith. And as I spoke to her on the elevator, I said, I am so glad that you said that. I'm getting by with my faith because sometimes that's what we need in order to get through a difficult situation. And I told her about this story that we were going to read at Mass today. I said, remember that story about Jesus walking on the water and Peter walking with him until he took his eyes off Jesus. He lost faith. He stopped losing and he stopped looking at Jesus. And what happened? He lost himself and he began to sink. I said to this young nurse, I said to her, keep your eye on Jesus. Keep your eye on Jesus. It's your faith that's going to give you the strength to get through this situation. Now, what do we have today in our country? And in Western civilization, we have a lot of people who um, no longer have faith. You get them saying very silly things. Oh, well, uh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. You know what that means? It means nothing. Well, I have a sense that, you know, there's some pretty things out there in the world and that I like to feel good about my fellow human beings. That's what it means. I'm spiritual. Faith is different. Faith is faith in Jesus Christ, keeping my eyes on him. And when things get tough, I look to him and he's going to give me the strength that I need to continue to do what I have to do. That's what the nurse told me. I have my faith. I'm looking at Jesus so that I can continue to do the job that I'm supposed to do. Don't be afraid to evangelize. Don't be afraid to evangelize. Tell people about Jesus. They might need to hear that in order to get through. You might save their lives. And you might even bring new babies into the world. How do you like that? We're never too old to bring new babies into the world. All right. Secondly is this, and this is a, 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 it's a it's double-pronged what I've been saying today. Um, people need, need heroes in order to have hope. People need heroes in order to have hope. So that sometimes when, you know, it looks like everything is lost and that the world is coming apart, we have to reflect back on what other people did before us. 
And it's unfortunate. In our society today, we have people talking about not teaching history anymore. How ridiculous is that? We're not going to teach history anymore because, well, some people weren't exactly what we think they should be by our standards today. You could make that claim about anybody. But there are heroes that we have to look to that have overcome tremendous obstacles in their own lives and in the lives of our country that young people, that old people, have to look to and say, yeah, there's an example of a hero. That person gives me hope that things can get better and will be better if good people are inspired to work hard, to make them better, to be filled with hope and courage for the future. Not too long ago, President Trump made a speech, and he proposed a garden of heroes, a garden of heroes. And I listened to that list of who the heroes were, and I said, yeah, how important it is to have heroes. Instead of tearing down statues and monuments of those people that we don't like or some people don't like for some reason, what about the heroes that made America, that made Americans great? Let me just list some of the names that the president mentioned. John Adams, second president of the United States. Susan B. Anthony, what did she do? Women's suffrage, extremely important. Susan B. Anthony. Clara Barton, Red Cross, American Red Cross, established it during the, the Civil War. Imagine what she did. Nurses going into that battlefield with human carnage all over the place. Amazing. Daniel Boone, pioneer. Henry Clay, great man, the great compromiser, Henry Clay. Boy, we need somebody like Henry Clay today. A compromise. How about a compromise with the Republicans and Democrats? Can we get a great man to do that, a great woman? It's disgraceful. The things they're doing, the things they're saying about each other. Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. The Alamo, remember the Alamo? Defended the Alamo. Frederick Douglass, a great black educator, a statesman, worked his way out of slavery, educated himself, and even had a meeting with President Lincoln. Now there's, there's a great man. Amelia Earhart, fantastic. This woman was flying a plane around the world. As far as I know, they haven't found her remains yet, but she was certainly heroic. Benjamin Franklin, not only a great inventor, but a great politician, a great statesman, an ambassador for the United States in France. What a wonderful man. Invented the Postal Service. Wow, imagine that. Billy Graham. We all remember Billy Graham. What he did for evangelization, not just in this country, but around the world, and began a movement for religious freedom behind the Iron Curtain. Billy Graham. You know, I'd like to add one in there, too. Bishop Sheen. What a Bishop Sheen. You pray for his cause for canonization. It's being held up. I don't know why. But what Bishop Sheen did for Catholics throughout the United States and his crusade against communism, that man was a hero. And I think, I'm even going to say it before the Pope says it, Bishop Sheen is a saint. You know, when I was a little boy, my father used to watch Bishop Sheen. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was fascinated by him. Imagine the whole country, he even beat out in the ratings Milton Berle. Some of you might remember Uncle Milty. Yeah, how about that? Amazing. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., what he did for civil rights, the words he spoke. That's a hero. And unfortunately, he died. He was murdered because of the stand that he took. Alexander Hamilton, 
the inventor of our American monetary system and the treasury. Lincoln, well, uh, you can't say anything more well, of a great man, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. Douglas MacArthur, a great general, commanding the Pacific, Pacific Fleet, the Army of the Pacific. How many of us can remember his farewell to West Point? The long gray line. Fantastic. The long gray line. What pride in the military. And when I cross the River Styx, there'll be but one, but one thought in my mind. The core, the core, and the core. Richie Cacciope, you know that by heart, I know. He was in West Point. Great. His, his final speech at the point. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. And now you have people disrespecting the flag. Holy cow. That flag which stands for freedom? That's nah, nah, not acceptable. Not acceptable. People fought and gave their lives for that flag. Christy McAuliffe, woman astronaut, lost her life an Apollo mission. What a hero for kids. What a hero for, for young women. George Patton in his battles in the western, western frontier of World War II. General Patton. What a man that was. And of course, we couldn't leave out Ronald Reagan. These are heroes. These are people that you should talk to your children and grandchildren about. Let them be proud of our heritage and let them see that even in the most difficult of circumstances, there is always hope. There are people of talent and people of courage who are going to stand up to do the right thing. When you get the feeling that you know, everything is lost and there is no hope, think about Peter walking on the water. And think about these great Americans that helped us to be free and be able to be here today. But we have to continue to protect our faith we have to continue to evangelize, and we have to continue to proclaim the greatness of America. Because, as Abraham Lincoln said, we are the last best hope of the world. God love you.